In this 10th episode, we will be discussing record high levels of prices for gold. We'll be discussing Bitcoin going back over $40,000 and if these two are a quality inflation hedge. Now, some of you may disagree with the topics that we talk about today. And if you do, I would love if you could email me at jordan at chapwoodinvestments.com. I've often found that some of my uh, biggest leaps in learning or even deepest convictions that I have in investment philosophy have either come with changing my mind about something or disagreeing with someone about something. And I hope that this episode provides you with that same opportunity. So thanks for tuning in, everyone, and great to have you here. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 10th episode of the Making Sense with Ed Butowski podcast. Great to have you join us today for uh, an exciting topic, a timely topic, even as we reach the recent high with one of the things we'll be discussing today. But Ed, I want to read a post that actually kind of stimulated this thought for me, and it's from a founder of, of Public Square. Um, and I just thought it was kind of interesting in terms of looking at how some of uh, the people are thinking about alternatives in today's market. And it starts with gold reached record highs last night and Bitcoin got back over 40,000. Americans aren't buying what the government's propagandists are selling. Americans don't believe the government when they say inflation is under control. Americans don't believe the government when they say they have our geopolitical footing under control. Americans don't believe the government when they say they have our nation's best interests in mind. So they're taking matters into their own hands. Hmm. I'll finish the last part as well. Americans no longer trust the corrupted systems we've been fed for years and they, they're investing in alternatives, alternative currencies, alternative companies, alternative entertainment. And he goes on with, with that thought. So what is your first reaction to that, that uh, statement? Well, it sounds like we're a bunch of right wing lunatics. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, there's definitely, you know, a lot of people out there that don't trust the government to handle anything. And, you know, I get calls from clients all the time, as do you, Jordan, about mm -hmm. people wanting, you know, to know, what they should be doing with their money and how the government is intruding in their privacy. Uh, so, you know, it's not surprising, uh, you know, gold being at an all time high has nothing to do with the U S government. Uh, it really, you know, it just doesn't. Uh, so, you know, I think they can take that question out of, you know, their thought process and you know bitcoin being at an all time high or not even an all time high but a, a yearly high mm -hmm. uh, you know a lot of people will say that that's inflationary but what was happening with bitcoin when inflation was soaring um shows that bitcoin is not an inflationary hedge so you Absolutely. know so if people are looking for investments to offset inflation gold and bitcoin just are not you know the two Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I share that uh, post not as a that's sort of an endorsement. Um, you know, I think there's always two ways to go at things. You can either be the extreme way, or you can try to balance in between the two. Um, a lot of times, when I think of money, uh, a lot of times people try to wrap it up in their political thoughts or how they emotionally feel about something, which honestly is kind of the the worst thing you can do. I think there's been various studies that have shown that it doesn't really matter if red or blue is in the White House that the the market is going to perform how it is regardless. Um, it's always gone up, regardless if it's Republican or Democrat. Um, so to kind of worry too much about, you know, political uh, correctness in terms of, you know, when it comes to your investments is not always the wisest. But I just know with, you know, the the gold reaching new highs with Bitcoin, you know, kind of coming back around and, and making the waves on social media. And then NFTs is another thing I want to talk about today, Ed. I know that you're a huge lover of NFTs. So we'll go over first, we'll go over gold then we'll go over Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and lastly, collectibles and NFTs. But the question of the day, Ed, is when was the U.S. dollar taken off the gold standard? 1971. 71. That's correct. And then also uh, 33 also played a little uh, context as well, just because at that point, um, FDR had had made some moves there. So if, if any of our listeners said 33, I'll give you half credit for that. But let's kind of get into gold reaching its highest price ever. So um, for our viewers, I'll put a, a picture of the price of gold on screen. So we'll reference that a little bit. But as you can see, it has reached the highest level in, in some time, and it's been you know growing for some years. But I want to kind of start this with a quote that I found. It's actually from Warren Buffett. And he said, assets that will never produce anything, but they are purchased in the buyer's hope that someone else will pay more for them in the future. Do you think that that's a fair, uh, a fair assessment of gold, or is that too simple? Well, 
That's an interesting quote um, coming from a value investor um, because you're, he's always looking for something to back up the value of the company that he is investigating or looking at buying or he's an owner of. And mm -hmm. gold is completely counter to that because there's nothing back in gold except supply and demand. And I had heard once that if you took all the gold that existed that had already been mined and melted it down, it would take up one inch of a football field and that's it. And that there are more contracts. There's 10 times more contracts on gold uh, trading in the futures markets than exist in gold. Meaning that if people took ownership of gold, like took possession, the price of gold could go up infinitely because mm -hmm. there's so much more demand from the contracts of gold than exist in the world. So if people really took some time and really analyzed gold and gold prices, people would be crazy not to buy gold. Um, and you know, that's kind of surprising to you because I'm not a big gold fan. Um, but when you look at supply and demand and you look at the demand, and if you just had demand for one more ounce that existed in the world, mm -hmm. then the price could go to an infinite number. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, you know, reasons that people buy gold, but it's not because of the income that it produces because it doesn't produce any income. Right. And, and kind of on that thought to go back to the, the post that I've made at the start here, it also can't be because of some, um, you know, rebelliousness towards the government or anything like that. I just think a lot of people purchase gold because they see it as in, in a worst case scenario, right? Like if the, the government burns down, if the central bank goes uh, belly up, um, at least I have my gold. Well, you know, if that scenario ever did come true, I don't know what good gold is going to do. You might need, um, you know, some bullets that might do better than gold for you. So I, I always worry that people see this as sort of a doomsday prepping um, sort of investment. Do you kind of agree with that? Or what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think most of the people that talk to me about gold are are kind of doomsday -er believers that something terrible is going to happen as long as they have gold, that there's always going to be a value for gold. Uh, you know, there's, there's lots of things like that. It's not just gold, there's silver, there's copper, uh, you know, there's diamonds uh, that we talked about on one of our previous podcasts. Right. So there's a lot of ways to retain the value of a, of something mm -hmm. uh, that you buy, but people, you know, it's just automatically default to gold. And, you know, there, there's definitely a use for gold. Mm -hmm. And, you know, right now, uh, you know, if you look at it as an inflation hedge, it's just not, mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't been proven to be an inflation hedge. If you look at uh, the rise of inflation recently and, you know, over the last six months, and then how, and, and, and you look at gold prices, gold prices didn't move up. Now, as as we've seen interest rates start to come lower or, or inflation rates come lower, you start to see gold move up. So if you look at this chart, you know, you can see that it it went down considerably when interest rates started coming or when inflation rates started coming lower. And mm -hmm. then as inflation rate came lower, gold prices went higher. So it, it just does not, mash up uh you know match up i should say right. with the with the idea that gold is an inflation hedge right. it just it just is not nor is bitcoin right and, and we'll get to that in a second and for our listeners uh what he's pointing at is that gold surged in 2020 due to the COVID 19 pandemic and then it fell about 20 percent in march of, of 2021 so there's not a lot of um i guess making sense there in terms of being an inflation hedge and the other thing that I kind of wanted to point out was in terms of growth. I mean, if we look at gold for both growth and in terms of an inflation hedge, when I initially saw that gold um, had increased to its highest point, and and, um, and and by the way, when we say our highest price in gold, we're talking about 20-year gold price by the ounce. Um, but it's almost like if you kind of think of a movie scene and all they show is a team, a football team score a touchdown, and they're all celebrating and you know they put six points up on the board and then they show the other team score, and it, the other team's up about 47 to one, right? When you think of gold standard compared to the S&P 500, I mean, we're talking a, a gross underestimate in terms of how the S&P has performed. Um, so I guess, you know, 
you never want someone to invest everything in, in one concentration, but talk to us a little bit about the S&P performance versus the gold's performance in terms of growth. Well, the S&P over any 10-year period has outperformed gold. Um, but comparing gold to the S&P, you have to remember that the S&P is made up of companies whose board of directors and, and C-level suite people or C-suite level people are all trying to make more earnings. Gold doesn't have a board of directors and doesn't have a PR firm and isn't trying to grow its earnings. So, you know, it's definitely hindered in that respect, but it's a, it's, it's a really tough comparison to make the S and P versus gold. Cause gold is just a mineral. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. And, and it's all based on scarcity and the S and P isn't that way. It's, it's a very different animal. Right. Okay. Well, I'm sure some people might disagree with us on, on all this. And, and again, it, it, it's not so much on, we can give any recommendations. It's just kind of a, a general thought and each person you're going to have to align your values and what you believe with how you're investing. So, you know, gold might be a, a great fit for someone and for someone else, it might be a terrible fit. I just think the whole point behind all of this is you kind of have to be um, as, as non-biased as you can be because no human is going to be totally unbiased, but you have to take this from um, an analytical approach and a, as subjective as you can be approach, because it seems like gold really brings out um, a, sort of a heated debate, which is uh, good for TV, but maybe not so much for your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. You hear people on television all the time talking about how great gold is and how mm -hmm. it's a great inflation hedge, but they can't support that with any facts mm -hmm. at all, but, but they can support it with selling and they're selling gold. Um, and when you do buy gold, you should be buying the gold coins or gold bars. Um, you should, yeah, you should be buying the physical gold. Um, and when you buy it, you got to make sure that you're not getting, you know, screwed around on the commission because mm -hmm. some of these gold people, you know, will, will kind of give you a different price than what's in the spot market. Right. Okay. Well, let's transition over to Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency as a whole. So as of the time of this recording, Bitcoin's at about $41,400. Um, its high was around 64, 64 and a half. Uh, that was back in 2021. Um, you know, Bitcoin is something that it seems like it's pretty easy to pick on in, in cryptocurrency as a whole. And I always try to stay open-minded, especially with a, you know, whether it's a new technology, whether it's a new investment. But the thing I constantly come back to whenever we talk about Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency is it's already deviated from its initial goal, right? Uh, so, you know, once the 2008 uh, pandemic, or excuse me, not pandemic, financial crisis happened, there was this great new, you know, way to decentralize your currency. There was this way to pay for something that didn't include the government. And then all of a sudden it become this, becomes this great investment, right? So if you have a, a goal for something and then right away you kind of change your direction, that's something to kind of, you know, draw a red flag immediately. And the second thing I'll kind of bring up in, in terms of red flags is, you know, just the issues that we've had with crypto exchanges, you know, in the past two years, you look at Binance, you look at FTX, and these aren't, you know, these companies are just using insider information or something. These is, this is, you know, high level criminal activity that are sending these founders to jail. Um, so I know those are kind of the bad things, uh, but I'd, I'd, I'd kind of just love to hear your blanket statement on your experience with crypto and, and what your thoughts are about it. Yeah, my, my experience with crypto is stay away. Mm -hmm. um, I've stayed away from it because there's really nothing backing crypto, uh, Bitcoin. The, the only reason it has any value is because other people say it has value. And, you know, with gold, there's a scarcity that makes it go higher. With Bitcoin, they have 21 million Bitcoins are available and 18 million have been mined. Mm -hmm. I don't even understand the mining part and how they go in, they find these things. Right. Um, but to put your hard earned money behind something that really doesn't have, you know, any business at all, uh, you know, is just kind of completely gambling. And the reason people do it, Jordan, as you and I talked is that, you know, people believe that, something is worth something and it's going to go higher because other people are going to start using it. Mm -hmm. and people, and, but it's gone from the use case to the value case. Right. And it started off being something that people could use and now it's become the value, you know, and then, you know, people will look you in the eye and tell you, yeah, there's a real value there. 
And I'm thinking, well, how? And he says, because it's going to go higher. And then every time it goes higher, it's like, well, see, it went higher. And mm -hmm. you're like, but why did it go higher? Well, because people bought it. Well, because why did people buy higher. it? Right. Because people said it was going to go higher. And, mm -hmm. and the whole the whole thing is kind of ridiculous to me. Mm -hmm. There's a fantastic uh, YouTube documentary by, I think his name is James Janney on YouTube. So if, if people wanted to look that up, that was a fantastic work on Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency as a whole. But I will say the one thing that I see, right, I have to kind of be the devil's advocate here and I'm the young guy. So I have to, to side with all the, the young people who just love crypto is right. I do see the possible, possible value in asset transfer, right? So I know a lot of people see cryptocurrency as, a, as an investment, but it does have some capabilities in terms of asset transfer. But again, that is not some way to kind of get back at the government by keeping their hands off of everything. Um, and, and I want to transition into talking about the central bank with that. But do you have any uh, thoughts on that? No, I... I, I think that the the NFTs and crypto, um, you know, have have been interesting to see how people can support things. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of reminds me of the tulip uh, craze that happened in Holland, uh, you know, over a hundred years ago, where people decided that tulips were worth, let's say, a thousand dollars a tulip, and that people went crazy trying to get their hands on tulips. Uh, anybody should look that up, the tulip craze. Um, but it only had that kind of value because people said it had that value. And and I, you know, and anybody who's watching this who doesn't agree with me, um, you know, trust me, I've been disagreed upon or disagreed with on this subject many times. And when when crypto went down, uh, you know, from sixty five thousand down into the twenties, you know, I I felt like I had a little bit of a reprieve uh, from from everybody. Now that it's going higher again, I'm like, okay, we're going to go through this again. Mm -hmm. You know, bring it on. Um, right. It still doesn't change the fact that there is nothing backing Bitcoin um, and the NFTs, non fungible tokens. Uh, you know, this again is another kind of strange thing. There's um, what are the pictures called? Oh, the uh, board ape. Or bored. You're no, about the, it's like the monkey that's like making the face. No, but there's pictures with NFTs, um, where you can get like a you can get an NFT of a a picture, and then anybody who uses that picture has to pay you. Right. Yeah, that's just that's kind of the the standard of how the the token works. Yeah. But you're, you're fast forwarding though. You're getting too far ahead. All so, right. So so the tokens are sort of like, you know. I, I know this one person who has a, a marketing firm who created tokens and says that he's worth like $120 million, even though he's just got a very small marketing firm because his tokens were, are trading and they're worth X number of dollars and he has a million of them. And somehow he thinks he's worth $120 million. But you know what? God love them. Well, what I wanted to say with uh, the central bank is a lot of people see Bitcoin and crypto as kind of like a, in the same way that they see gold as a rebelliousness from the government. They see crypto as that to the uh, central bank. And, and I won't be sitting here defending the central bank and saying that, you know, let's kiss their, their ring and, and all this stuff. But Rooting against the central bank almost sounds like rooting against the pilot of your airplane going down, right? For us to root against the central bank is just kind of ludicrous to me. I mean, the central bank, and well, let's give them their flower for a moment, they have did a fairly decent job of, of um, settling down inflation, which they did cause, I will say that. But at the same time, what are we talking about if we talk about price stability, if we talk about economic standard in America, if we want our own central bank to fail? You know what I mean? So by using Bitcoin to kind of go against what the central bank is, and, and I know that there's, you know, whenever we talk about government, there's, there's, you know, miscellaneous activities at hand, I'm sure. But again, it, it's kind of this, this debate of being one side or the other, but it's always important to just stay in the middle. I don't know. It's kind of my thoughts on, on the central bank and, and Bitcoin. And what do you think? Yeah, well, the central bank, you know, is, is very necessary, just like there's central banks in every country. Um, 
except for Argentina, soon to be. Well, <laughs> very much so. Uh, so the central banks definitely have, you know, reasons to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I don't think that people are necessarily rooting against the central bank as much as they're rooting for an alternative way to transfer assets. Uh, but don't forget that the central bank could have a digital currency as well. True. And True. that digital currency would be the dollar. That'll be a day. Well, to kind of uh, conclude this kind of section, I just think when it, when we talk about cryptocurrency, I think we're so early on in the stage. I mean, you know, Binance was founded in 2017. Uh, FTX was founded and is already bankrupt, I think, for since 2018. So we're still at a very early stage with this. It could go somewhere that, that we don't really know. One thing that we're, as humans, very bad at doing is predicting the future. I'm just saying with the picture that we have in front of us right now, it's it's a very risky um, you know, opportunity to go ahead and invest in crypto or, or something along those lines. I just say it's always good to have an open mind. Yeah, and, and if you're looking to put your money someplace to offset inflation, crypto and gold are not the places to go. Mm -hmm. uh, real estate tends to be the better place uh, to offset inflation. Uh, so... You know, you really have to understand the benefit of what it is that you're looking at, not just what it is. Right. And the benefit of crypto or the benefit of gold is not inflationary hedges. Right. Well, let's kind of get into our last segment here, which is collectibles and NFTs. And then you kind of uh, mentioned NFTs already. For those who don't know, NFTs are simply just a uh, digital painting, a digital picture, a digital I guess, asset, you could call it, that people have been trading. Um, someone can make the asset and say it's worth this much. And, and if they trade it and someone else sees it for a higher value, that's that's how it gets its worth. So it does trade similar to crypto. Um, you know, there's not a lot of intrinsic value that's going to be had in this conversation just because it, it almost makes no sense how uh, one would be willing to pay, you know, X amount versus X amount or where they get their value from. Um, but you already kind of mentioned how that works. But I have heard a, a very popular collectibles and NFT kind of advisor always try to group collectibles and NFTs together. And uh, collectibles, Ed, as, as you always talk about, are sneakers, um, their wine, whiskey barrels, horses, you name it. Just um, give us kind of a breakdown of collectibles and, and their benefit possibly to a portfolio, and then we can kind of compare and contrast with NFTs. Yeah, well, everything on collectibles comes back to scarcity. Um, so the more scarce something is, as long as there's a demand for it, which makes them scarce, the price of it would go higher. Um, so I like to use the analogy of a, a, a football game. And if there was a million seat arena, that the price of those tickets would be very, very low because there aren't, wouldn't be necessarily a million people wanting to go see the game. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to have stuff that has scarcity right. and that's what Bitcoin brings is that there is a scarcity to it. Gold, mm -hmm. there's a scarcity as well. Uh, and they should be inflationary hedges, but they haven't proven to be that. And right. I'm not exactly sure why somebody smarter than me would have to explain it. Right. But you also have whiskey barrels, you have wine, you know, and, and a wine, you know, there's a certain number of bottles that are made with a certain vintage, uh, and a certain type of grape from a certain region. Mm -hmm. And the fewer the, those are, the more desirable they are. Right. And I think the, the benefit of mm -hmm. having a sneaker, of having a, you know, even a nice car, a luxury car or fine art, uh, the benefit is it almost works similar to a secured loan. If we think about the difference between unsecured versus a secure, secured loan, the secured loan is backed by something, right? So if I invest in a, a Michael Jordan trading card, I have a physical item that this uh, this is backed by. So worst case scenario, I can at least get something back because I have this physical item in front of me. Whereas if we talk about NFTs and, and crypto, it's kind of just a, what's the word that Matthew McConaughey uses, a fugazi? It's, it's kind of just um, a figment of imagination unless someone else believes that with you. So I do think that there is a lot more uh, conversation to be had about physical, even even gold, at least gold, something physical, as you mentioned. Um, but in these other ones, you have to remember that about the top 1%, 1% 1 
is going to be collectible. Not all Michael Jordan cards are going to be uh, collectibles. Not all sneakers are going to be um, collectibles as well. I just think there's a, a real benefit to having something physical, as you mentioned, including real estate. Yes, without question. Sure. So I think other than that, I mean, I guess what we're just trying to say is you kind of have to keep an open mind here. Um, I know, Ed, that you've been kind of banging your horn for alternatives for about three decades now. Um, so I guess what about alternatives? If you had if you had someone for 60 seconds, what about alternatives has always kind of drawn you to them and, and what continues to draw your interest to them? Well, they can go up when other assets go down. Right. They, they can also go down when other assets go up. They're what we call non-correlated. And the genius of asset allocation is understanding the correlation of your assets. Mm -hmm. And you have the only way that you can get non-correlation is to have investments, uh, well, that don't go up and down together. I mean, right. uh, um, so if you have the S&P 500 and you have utilities and you have financial stocks, you need to have. <laughs> you didn't get enough sleep last night, did you? No. <laughs> but you need to have alternatives right. that can go up when other things are going down. This way you get a smooth ride in terms of your return. So if you wanted to get 1% a month, the only way to do that is to have alternatives in there that can offset the down move in the public market investments. And this is a, a general question because I'm trying to put myself in the mind frame of a listener. Uh, this is not a recommendation, but generally speaking, what is the proper amount of uh, alternatives in a portfolio? I know it depends on you know how much net worth you have, what your debt is, all of these various things. And hopefully that's where we can come in and help. But generally speaking, what is the amount of alternatives that you would like in a portfolio? Yeah, to, to properly diversify out the risk, you should have 20 to 30% of your money in alternatives. So not 100? No. 100 into Bitcoin right now. Okay. Well, that's all I have today. Is there any uh, last thoughts from you? No. No, this has been a good subject. Yes. Yeah, so to conclude, gold, which is not a new inflation hedge, I realize that, but gold, Bitcoin other cryptos and collectibles and NFTs are what we talked about today. If, if you have any disagreements with these, I honestly would love to hear them. Okay. I love hearing debates. That's how I, I kind of develop a further point of view or even change my point of view. Uh, Winston Churchill said, the man who doesn't change his mind changes nothing. So that's a quote that I really live by. And I know you've heard that probably like 10 times, um, but it's been fantastic being with you all. It's our 10th episode and it's been a, a good ride so far, um, but we will close for today and we look forward to having you back next time on Making Sense. Thanks. Thanks.